Test, test. All right, howdy, everybody. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, welcome back from break. Hopefully it's nice and quick. Um, excited for this morning's PLD. We have a friend of mine, Luke Crouch, joining us. He will be uh, talking about a really cool topic, cryptography. Um, he is a privacy and security engineer at Mozilla. They work on Firefox. Uh, should be a really awesome talk. Of course, afterwards, uh, we'll be around, you'll be around for questions, and then I believe you all won a pizza party. Uh, so congrats on that. So stick around for lunch here, too, which is really awesome. Um, let's all welcome Luke, and uh, thank you so much. Ooh. All right, thanks. So we got uh, everything set up just the right way with all the right mojo, hopefully. Um, if I break something, sorry about that. We'll figure it out. Um, so you all are going to get a refreshed version of this talk that I've given lots of times. The great thing about ancient cryptography is it's, it's not changing anymore. So you just kind of leave it alone. Um, so uh, before I get started, two sort of housekeeping items. Oh, no. Uh, OK, so some plugs. Um, Tuesday, March 12th here. Uh, is the Tulsa UX, Tulsa Web Devs 10th semi-annual. Sometimes we sort of do this lightning talk thing. Uh, and these are always cool because you get about five or 10 topics really quick. Uh, so it's free and I think dinner is provided. And then, come on clicker, this is gonna be driving me nuts. So B-Sides Oklahoma is happening April 3rd through 5th at the Glenpool Conference Center. Um, any, who knows what B-Sides is, anybody? All right, that's fine, because uh, Oklahoma actually has one of the nation's best B-sides. It's sort of like a, an off-the-track security conference that grew out of DEF CON and Red Hat and stuff like that. Um, it's also free, plus they offer lunch, and there's even, like I think, a bar for free. So that's a highlight. Um, and then finally, May 17 is the annual 200 OK Web Developer Conference. Again, here at Atlas, this is a cool one-day conference where we get speakers from around the country, sometimes around the world. Um, and there's really cool talks and after-party stuff, too. Okay, so then, okay, the clicker's driving me nuts. Is it okay if I stand over here? Yes. Okay. Okay, so just to understand the audience here, uh, how many, uh, everyone's students? How many students? Just everybody? Okay. Anybody not a student? Okay. Anybody a crypt cryptography professional? Okay, cool. Then no one can call my BS. Okay. Um, so if you came here thinking that this has anything to do with cryptocurrency, sorry, I have another talk uh, about crypto jacking, which does have to do with cryptocurrency. Anyone's interested, maybe I come back and give that some other time. But if you're here for cryptocurrency, just wait for the free food, ignore me. Okay, so I'm Luke, I'm not a cryptography engineer, I'm a web developer that got into security. And when I was getting into security, I remember feeling like I couldn't really be a security person because I was scared of math, I was scared of cryptography, like all of these things uh, seemed really, really uh, sort of exotic to me. Um, and so if that sounds like you, then hopefully this talk will help you because I found that learning about cryptography from sort of like the ancient times and then building up to what we use every day helps the concepts click a lot for me. So um, if that, if, hopefully that'll, that'll help you out. Um, but what I'm gonna do today is cover 2,700 years of cryptography in about 36 to 40 minutes. Uh, so don't try to take notes, I'm gonna go too fast. All of these uh, slides are up on my speaker deck, uh, which is right there. Uh, and so the goal here is not really for you to understand everything about cryptography, it's for you to see where cryptography came from so that you can sort of feel confident and like it's not just magic, okay? So don't worry about grokking everything. If something doesn't click, like there's no test. There's no test, right? There's always Oh God, okay, sorry, there's a test. I don't know what it is, but okay. Oh, yeah. Yes, yep. 
Okay, so the flow of this talk summarizes a book uh, by Simon Singh called The Code Book. So you should read this book. It's very cool. It's more biographical and no, no math and no tech and stuff like that. It's just a bunch of cool stories about cryptography. There's also a course on Khan Academy called Journey into Cryptography. This one's way better for ex starting to get into the math of uh, especially like Diffie-Hellman and things like that, which we'll talk about later. And then if you want just hands-on advice for running HTTPS correctly, there's a book called Bulletproof TLS and PKI. Um, so these are really good sources. If you like online videos, there's a Chalk Talk series uh, by Kelsey Houston Edwards that talks about uh, the math of even like post-quantum cryptography, lattice cryptography, super singular isogeny, Diffie-Hellman, stuff like that. Um, so all this stuff is out there. Okay, but let's do the cryptography from 500 BC to HTTPS. Um, I find it helps understand cryptography if you compare it to another technique for secrets called steganography, or as Dolly likes to spell it, steganography. Uh, so some interesting ancient steganography stories. Uh, in about 500 BC, uh, Histeus of Miletus was ruling Susa, but wanted to go back. So he shaved a servant's head and wrote a message to like the ruler back then, and then let the servant's hair grow back out, and then sent them along the way when they got there shave their head off, look at the message underneath, and like, oh, okay, there was this writing thing. Like, okay, well, that was fun. Um, another cool steganography technique, from the same time, there's records of using like wooden and wax tablets, where uh, there's a real message carved into wood, and then you cover that up with wax. Then you carve a message into the wax. So if this tablet is intercepted, they think the wax is the real message, and then the recipient knows to melt the wax off and see the real message underneath. That's kind of cool. And then, um, <clears throat> speaking of wax in ancient China, senders would write messages on silk paper, crumple them up, cover them with wax, and then eat them, and then travel somewhere and <clears throat> retrieve them. <laughs> and then the first records of invisible ink came from the first century AD. Uh, Pliny the Elder was the first one. They, even though these steganography tricks seem really simple, they can actually be pretty effective. And if, you, if we have time later, you can ask me about a steganography trick we came up in Firefox that has to do with differential privacy and all this other cool stuff. Okay, but especially important to modern security is cryptography. Again, Dolly spells it cryptography. Uh, cryptography is not just hiding messages, it's transforming a message into a completely different message. And so you do this with a cipher. So the first ciphers used in writing were permutations, kind of like anagrams. Um, the codebook calls these transpositional. I say permutation because that's what modern ciphers say. Um, they seem simple, but they can be pretty strong. So for example, consider this short sentence, uh, which has 35 letters that could be turned into 57 million trillion trillion possible anagrams. Um, now when we measure how strong an encryption system is, we measure it by its time complexity, which is sort of how long it would take to break it. Um, and that's why you hear cryptographers say things like, this will take longer than the heat death of the universe and all that kind of crap. So for example, if you had this ciphertext experimentation's fresh chord loss, and you could rearrange it once per second to guess what the plain text was, it would still take a trillion billion years to check all the possibilities. So even this little anagram is pretty strong. Uh, but you can't just send someone some random anagram, because then it's impossible for the intended recipient to know which anagram is the right one. For example, the exact same letters could be deciphered as either do not attack at midnight or attack at mind do tonight. And that would be no good if you got those wrong. So you need some deterministic way to encrypt and decrypt anagrams. Um, we do this with an encryption algorithm and a key. There's always a key. So the most fundamental principle of cryptography from ancient to modern times is Kirchhoff's principle, which says crypto systems should be secure even if everything about the system except the key is public knowledge. So the first crypto system for anagrams was a thing called a skittily. So to use it, you wrap a piece of paper around a cylinder, and then you write a message across all the bands. Uh, when the paper is unwound, it looks like one long, thin uh, strip of garbage, garbage letters. So the skiddly was a machine that implemented a rail fence cipher. So in this cipher, you write a plain text message like they are attacking from the north diagonally across some number of rows. And in this case, it's four. Then you go through each row and write the letters from left to right and you end up with this anagram ciphertext. So to decrypt this, the recipient knows the key is four rows, so they would draw a grid of four rows and as many columns as there are letters, then write the cipher letters from the top here across the grid diagonally to recover the plain text at the bottom. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's call a skiddly the first ancient crypto system and try to break that. So breaking encrypted messages is called cryptanalysis. Uh, with a rail fence cipher, you can simply just kind of like try a number of rows by hand. So this is just a brute force key search. Uh, and we're, we're here, we're only guessing the key. We're not guessing the trillions of anagrams, right? Um, so for example, to break this cipher text on top, encrypted with rail fence, you'd write it down over grids with two, then three, then four, then five rows, and eventually find that the right key is five, and the plain text is defend the east wall. So the first cryptanalysis is just brute force key searching. Um, and since we measure the strength by uh, the time it takes to recover the plain text, it means the strength of any crypto system that's facing brute force is, depends on the total key space through which the attacker has to like search, right? Um, so to break a message encrypted with a skiddly, how many possible rows could there be? How many possible widths could there be? Um, you just wrap the message around a bunch of different cylinders and see if it makes sense. So skiddly and brute force is our first battle between code makers and code breakers. Uh, skip ahead about 700 years and we get to an encryption system hopefully everyone's heard of. Uh, doesn't just move letters around but changes letters into other letters. So nearly everyone's heard of the Caesar cipher where the algorithm is to shift the alphabet and the key is the number that you shift it. Um, so in this example, we shift the alphabet by, let's say, negative three. So the plain text E at the top becomes ciphertext B at the bottom, and the plain F becomes the cipher C, and so on. So the code makers have this new encryption system, but the bad news is that the brute force can also break a Caesar cipher pretty easily because you can only shift the first century Latin alphabet 23 times. So there's only 23 possible keys, and you only have to search through 23 possible keys. Um, ask me about this later if you want to know how somebody used Caesar shift to evade Russian censorship. So substituting letters is cool, but we need a way to do it with more than 23 keys. So it would take an attacker a long time to search through all of them. So remember back in the anagrams, we're able to create 57 million trillion trillion random anagrams out of 35 letters. The same math says that if we have an alphabet with 26 letters, like English, we can make 403 trillion trillion possible anagrams of that. Now that's a really big key space. So what you can do is substitute each letter with a different letter, but instead the key is a random anagram of the alphabet. So the key could be something like this, or this, or any of these, or any of the 403 trillion trillion possible alphabets. So even if an attacker could check a different one every second, it would take them 120 billion billion years to check them all, um, which is super cool. It brings up two important points. Uh, randomness is good. So from ancient ciphers to modern ciphers, uh, implementing randomness, especially in keys, is like a very fundamental thing in every crypto system I've ever seen. Um, and then second, most crypto systems don't try to be perfect. Uh, there is, there's a little, padlock there to add if you want to ask about the, the perfect one. Um, most crypto systems try to force attackers into key searches that would just take too long, right? Um, so to attack this, this random anagram, uh, the attacker has to perform a key search that would take several decades even with a modern high-end computer. Um, but there's always a catch, and that is that in this crypto system, this key is really complicated and hard to memorize. So if someone's going to write it down on a post-it note and stick it to a monitor right next to the screen. So this is like the never-ending challenge of cryptography, which is to keep the key secret and keep the key safe. Uh, so to keep it more secret and safe, can we make some kind of random-ish key that is easier to memorize? And we'll do this uh, by using a key phrase and then using that to make an alphabet. So we start with a key phrase like Julius Caesar and we remove any duplicate letters. Then we write it and all the remaining letters of the alphabet in order, skipping letters that were already in the key phrase. Does that make sense? Um, so now we have a cipher alphabet to encrypt our plain text. And this is called a key derivation function. So who's heard of this yet? And your, I don't know, students have not, probably not there yet? Okay. Uh, but it's a way to turn some kind of source material or key material into a key that's suitable for some crypto system. Uh, so now we can encrypt the plain text above into the cipher text below using this easy to memorize key. Uh, so we have an easy to use cipher against brute force that would still take billions and billions of years to perform by hand. 
And this password-based cipher system was considered unbreakable for about 800 years, because passwords are always secure. And then in the ninth century, Abu Yusuf al-Kindi wrote a treatise on code breaking, and he explained a frequency analysis attack. So a frequency analysis attack is based on the fact that in every language, some letters occur more often than other letters. So if you have some cipher text and you can count which cipher letters are the most frequent and map those to the letters that are the most frequent in that language's alphabet, uh, you can guess that they're the most frequent plain letters. And if you bring in some more language frequency rules, you can give yourself some even better guesses and then apply those guesses to the ciphertext, and you'll see some common patterns emerge. For example, what's a common three-letter word in English that ends with H-E? The. the, right. So now you've figured out that the cipher L is a T, and now you have a little bit more of the key. So now you go back and you look at another common three-letter word that begins with A, and now you know that cipher V is plain D, and you know that cipher P is plain N. And so finding part of the key can help you find the rest of it as well. So two hours later, you can reconstruct the whole plain text and the whole key instead of billions of years. So, which means frequency analysis is way faster than brute force. OK, so now the code breakers have the upper hand. They can find these keys in hours instead of billions of years. Uh, until the code makers come up with a new system that's not vulnerable to frequency analysis. In the 15th century, Leon Battista Alberti uh, devised a polyalphabetic substitution cipher. Uh, it uses two or more alphabets. So for example, here we see the plain alphabet followed by two randomized cipher alphabets. In this system, to encrypt the word secret, you encrypt the first letter with the first alphabet, so S becomes R. For the next letter, you go down to the next alphabet, so the E becomes A, then wrap back up, so C becomes B, back down, T becomes H, and then E becomes K, and T becomes K. So using two cipher alphabets means that the plain E has become both an A and a K, and that the cipher K could be either an E or a T. So this breaks frequency analysis, because now all the frequencies are wrong or different. Right? Okay, so now the code makers have a system that's not vulnerable to frequency analysis, which means attackers are back to using brute force, taking billions of years. Uh, but even though this beats frequency analysis, it has the same problem that the random anagram had, even worse, which is that this is a really complicated key to try to memorize, right? Um, so the code makers need some, another key derivation function. They need some way to turn an easy to memorize keyword into uh, this polyalphabetic system. And so in the 16th century, Blas de Vigneur, somebody who knows how to say that, correct me, uh, came up with a new system to do this called uh, Le Chiffre and Chiffrable. Um, it uses the Vigneur square, which is this lovely device. Um, at the top is the plain alphabet, and below that, the alphabet is shifted to the left by one space, and then below that, it's shifted to the left again, and then on and on until at the end, it's back to the plain alphabet. Um, to use the square, first you would repeat a keyword, so in this case, it's gonna be secret across the top of some plain text, in this case, attack from the south at dawn. To change the first plain text letter with the alphabet on the row, I always get this, <laughs> I script it out, but it's like, okay, so you change the first plain text later, letter with the alphabet on the row that starts with the first letter of the keyword. So in this case, to encrypt the A and attack, you go down to the row that starts with the S from secret. And then go to the plain text letter A column, and you get an S. Then to encrypt the plain T, go down to the row that starts with the E from secret and go to the T column from the plain text, and this plain T becomes an X. Stay on the T column for the next plain T, but now move up to the row that starts with the C in secret, and this second plain T becomes a V. So again, the same plain letter became two different cipher letters. Uh, you repeat that for the rest of that, and after you've done that for the whole plain text, you have this cipher text that's been encrypted with an easy to memorize key and no frequency analysis. Um, if you can spot 
I don't have a prize. But if you can spot another big hole in the cipher system, which we're about to break, um, I'll show it to you. Or I'll give you some kind of prize. We'll figure it out later. Don't hold me to that. We won't figure it out later. OK. So now the code makers have another password-based crypto system that's easy to use, and it forces attackers into like brute force that would take billions of years. Um, but the code breakers are not giving up. They're going to turn to the new machines and processes of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, as early as the 1700s, every European power had a black chamber. Uh, this was typically a state-controlled post office with an assembly line of code breakers who would man in the middle letters during delivery. So they opened all the envelopes, they copied any encrypted messages, uh, and then handed, them, handed their copies over to big teams that would do code breaking on them. And the Vigneur Square was available, but not always used. So they were breaking all of the other ciphers. Uh, plus, it was only a matter of time before someone would find vulnerabilities in Vigneur. And if you're into computers, you might recognize the name of the person who did. So in 1854, Charles Babbage uh, broke the Vigneur cipher without using any of his mechanical engineering. He just had a keen insight, which was he realized that while the keyword-based Vigneur square created all of these like false letter frequencies where plain letters become different cipher letters and vice versa. Uh, repeating the keyword meant that there would still be word frequencies. So for example, if the keyword king is used by Vigneur Square to encrypt the sun and the man and the moon, it would result in this ciphertext. And in this ciphertext, the word the is encrypted as DPR, then as BUK, and then as BUK again. So the cipher is repeated, the cipher word is repeated when it's displaced by some multiple of the length of the keyword. So to break Vigneur, he would first look for repeated sequences of letters and measure the space in between those repetitions to find the length of the keyword. So for example, in this cipher text, encrypted with Vigneur, these four cipher words are all repeated. We count the spacing between the repeated cipher words, and they're 95, 5, 20, and 120. And since the only common factor of all of those numbers is the number 5, we know that the keyword is five letters long. And once you know a little bit about the key, you can easily get more of it. So at this point, you could brute force looking for all the five letter words, right? Um, but once, the keyword, once you know the keyword is five letters long, Babbage also broke the ciphertext into five chunks at each of those positions and then broke those chunks with regular frequency analysis and then recombined to find the original message. Um, there was also another hole in this system. And if anybody spotted it already, I, I don't know how to reward you, but it would be amazing. <laughs> um, so every time the plain text is an A character, it leaks a keyword letter into the ciphertext. So the, you only need to break enough of the ciphertext to see where the A's are. And then you'll know the words, the letters of the keyword. So with Babbage's technique, you'll know that the keyword is five letters long. And with this vulnerability, you'll know what the letters are. And at that point, it's just a game of Wordle to find the secret key. Okay, so now you've got a pretty even race going on between code makers with Vigneur and then the black chambers of code breakers using Babbage, Babbage and frequency analysis. Um, and then there's two more major tech breakthroughs. So in the 1800s, the telegraph is invented, which lets people communicate over long distances that are connected by wires. Um, the first US telegraph used a single wire system, which is great, but then how can you represent letters or words as electrical signals on a single wire? So this, the, this telegraph was invented by Samuel Morse. Uh, Morse code is an encoding scheme to turn letters into sequences of dots and dashes. But note, Morse code is an encoding scheme. It's not encryption. There's nothing secret about this. This is all still plain text. Um, 50 years later, the first radios are invented. And they're great for sending instant military commands back and forth without having to set up the wires. Uh, but since messages are traveling over the air, the enemy can receive every single message as well. And this means you need an equally quick encryption tool, which would become one of the most notorious encryption devices in history. Any guesses? 
So Enigma machine was invented by Arthur Scherbius in the early 20th century and deployed extensively and devastatingly by Nazi Germany. So Enigma has an input keyboard, electromechanical rotors, and an output lamp board. And when a plain text letter is pressed on the keyboard, it completes an electrical circuit that passes through the rotors and then lights up one of the cipher letters. So Enigma used a series of scrambling wire rotors that stepped around with each letter. And this is easier to show with a diagram. So at the top here, when you press the plane A, it might travel through the circuit at the top and result in a cipher G, but each press advanced the rightmost rotor one position. So with a rotor moved one position, in the bottom here, the next time you pressed the plane A, it would follow a completely different path and result in a completely different cipher letter. So in this case, a C. And every time you type a letter, you change the pathways. You get a new alphabet every time. So when a rotor completed a full rotation, it would advance the rotor to the left of it, creating whole new pathways all over again. So Enigma is one of these polyalphabetic ciphers, but you can use it as fast as you can type. And this is the inside of uh, one of the rotors, and the green jumble of wires is the scrambling wires. And so you'll notice that they were like, they're basically hard-coded. They're hard-wired to have a certain pathway, right? Uh, that'll be important. Uh, so the first Enigma machines used three rotors that scrambled 26 characters for 17,000 possible alphabets. So the key in Enigma was the starting position of the rotors, because it's going to change at the same time once you have the starting position. But the rotors could also be rearranged, and six rearrangements mean that it meant that it had 100,000 possible keys. And furthermore, the Nazis used code books with a different key for every day, so code breakers could check a key by picking some rotor settings, they could intercept some messages, type that into a bunch of Enigma machines that all started with different starting positions, uh, and they could, if they had 96 Enigma machines, they could crack the key by tea time, right? Um, so this is hard, but reasonable. Remember, we're talking about black chambers, like assembly line style code breaking. Yeah, was there? Yeah, um, well, well, so I think we cover it. Okay. Uh, I think we talk about how the, how, how the receivers get it. Um, okay, but Enigma also had this plug board on the front that could make even more substitutions. So with it, you could swap up to six letters. And so six swaps of 26 letters meant there's 100 billion possible plug board settings. And so if you combine all of that, then there were 10 trillion possible keys for Enigma. So it would take 38 million Enigma machines to search through them all in a day. And on top of all of this, they didn't use the day key for all of the messages in the day. Instead, they used the day key to send a message key for every message. So the sender would pick ASD as a message key and then type that twice at the beginning of the message. So if they type ASD, ASD, that might become QWERTY to the receiver. The receiver types QWERTY they set, their enigma, they set their enigma to the day key, and they type QWERTY, and they will see ASD, ASD. And now they know that the, rest of the, the key for the rest of the message is to take their rotors and put it in A, then S, then D, and then type the rest of the message from there. When they type the rest of the message, they'll come up with all the plain text. So all of this was meant to minimize the amount of ciphertext created by any single day key. Yeah? Sorry, you may talk about it, but what would they do with the plug board? Here we go. <laughs> um, so if you're attacking Enigma with those 38 machines, oh, sorry, the, the plug board was in the day key. You're right. So the plug board settings is in the day key. That would stay the same. So only the rotor orientations would change for each message. Does that make sense? So they'd leave the plug boards the same. Yeah. So every, everyone, every Enigma machine for that day had the same plug board settings. They would only change the rotors for each message. Sorry, yeah, I, I blew past your question. Um, so if you're attacking Enigma with those 38 million machines, it would take you a day to crack a single message, not all of the day's messages. Um, so Enigma was this culmination of like, you know, Apex crypto systems, polyalphabetic substitution ciphers, and like the technology of the day, electromechanical. Um, technology. Uh, but as we've already seen, no code making can't be broken. 
Uh, so the story of cracking Enigma starts in Poland in the Bureau of Schifro, which was the Polish black chamber. So after the First World War, a lot of Europeans were like, oh, well, gentlemen, don't spy on each other, right? Like, there's never going to be another war. That was the war to end all wars. And Poland was like, haha, yeah, right, we've got Germany on this side and Soviet Union on this side. Uh, they couldn't, like, just stand around and wait to be attacked. So they kept, uh, kept at the cryptanalysis uh, between the wars. Um, so I'm trying to get my date right. Let's see. So they received an Enigma machine and an instruction booklet from French espionage because the French were like, we won't ever need this. We're never going to go to war with Germany again. Um, and then Marian Rajewski was the sort of cryptanalyst, cryptanalyst the, the guy who broke stuff uh, in Poland. So like Babbage, Rajewski realized that repetition is a vulnerability for any crypto system. So he focused on the repeated three letters in the message keys. So he saw that when certain ciphertext appeared, first, or a certain cipher letter appeared first, another letter would always appear fourth because it was the same plain letter being encrypted the second time by the same day key. In later messages, that fourth cipher letter would show up as the first cipher letter somehow. It would just, they happen to pick a message key for that. And then that would then be followed by a new fourth cipher letter and so on. So eventually these chains would cycle around and start all over again. Um, so he didn't know any of the plain text of these letters. He only knew that this, these cycles, these links, this pattern of links kept happening. Um, and he had a brilliant insight, which was that the number of links in those chains is only caused by the rotors. It has nothing to do with the plug board. So like the Vigneur Square, Enigma leaked some information about its key into its ciphertext. So he could split the problem in two and concentrate on breaking the 100,000 rotor settings and ignore, the plug, ignore breaking, breaking the 100 billion <laughs> uh, plug board settings first. So they created a cyclometer, which was a device that simulated all the rotor settings of Enigma to record all the possible chain lengths in the cycles. So they kept their results in a card catalog system that took them one year to build. Uh, but by the time they finished with it, they could intercept some Enigma messages and then count the chain links in the ciphertext and then simply look up what the rotor settings were. Um, so they made the world's first rainbow table. Anyone familiar with rainbow tables? Yeah, they're great. So this was the first one. So after the rotor settings, and it turns out that finding the plug board settings was easy. So like we saw before, once you have part of the key, getting the rest of it tends to become easier. So in this case, they just unplugged all of the plug boards. They set the rotors to what they knew they were supposed to be, and they started typing the ciphertext. And then they would see some pretty obvious letter swaps in common words, like R and W being swapped in weather. So now they know that that's one of the swaps. OK, so after the cyclometer, uh, the Polish created more electromechanical machines for code breaking. Uh, their bombs could recover Enigma machines in about a couple hours. Uh, in 1939, they smuggled all of their research out to the Allies, and then two weeks later, Hitler invaded Poland. So the Allies picked up Enigma code breaking. They built bigger bombs uh, that were operated by Women's Royal Navy Service at chambers like Bletchley Park, where Alan Turing uh, worked on code breaking. And inspired by Turing's ideas, Tommy Flowers designed the Colossus Mark I, which was complete in 1943 and used 1,600 vacuum tubes to perform operations many times faster than electromechanics. And Colossus is regarded as the first programmable computer. So with Colossus attacking Enigma, the code breakers have regained the upper hand. Uh, so Colossus is searching for and finding Enigma keys a lot faster than brute force can. It's an example of new technology changing the time complexity of a crypto system. When I give this talk and we talk about post-quantum -crypt post crypto, that's very important because there's new tech that breaks all current crypto. And that's, well, we don't have time for that unless we do in questions. Um, so sometimes code breakers come up with new attacks and sometimes they get a hold of new technology. Uh, so we've got computer powered code breaking against electromechanical code making and the world starts communicating with these computers more and more. So the code makers need to catch up. In early computers like Colossus, the electrical signals weren't very precise, so it made sense to only distinguish between two states, on and off, represented by ones and zeros. And that's binary that we know today. And that's why we have binary. Um, and like the telegraph required Morse code to turn 
letters into electrical signals, computers need a way to encode letters into ones and zeros. And there's two steps to this. Uh, so the first step is encode each letter into a number. In this example, we use ASCII encoding for that, but there's lots of encoding schemes. Uh, and then you take those numbers and you turn them into binary, ones and zeros. So the result is that the letters SOS at the top become this sequence of ones and zeros at the bottom. So this is just encoding. There's no secret here. These ones and zeros are plain text. Everybody could, could discover this. Now, in binary, uh, when we get our letters into binary, we can encrypt them at this level of ones and zeros. So we could perform any of the encryption algorithms we've seen so far on ones and zeros, right? So for example, consider this short sentence encoded to ASCII, then encrypted with a rail fence cipher with two rails becomes some cipher text of binary. And then if you were trying to decode it in ASCII, you would get this garbledy gook, right? So if you've ever seen this, like in text, you're probably looking at encrypted text, improperly decoded text, or both. So in binary, there's this cool bitwise operator called XOR. You give XOR two bits of input, that is two zeros, two ones, or one zero, one one. Um, and XOR says to output a zero if the inputs are equal, or output a one if the inputs are different. The key thing about XOR is that the result is a 50-50 coin flip. And this becomes super important to every binary crypto cipher, like a digital coin flip. It needs to be exactly equally likely. A one or a zero needs to be exactly equally likely. OK, so now we can perform a substitution algorithm on bits on the ones and zeros with XOR. So for example, you encode this short sentence with ASCII, then you encode Julius Caesar with ASCII, then encrypt the binary plain text by XORing it with the binary key, and you get this binary output, which looks like this when you finally ASCII decode it. So notice the key was only long enough to encrypt some of the plain text. But we did exactly the same thing. So this was the uh, XORing with Julius Caesar. I guess the point I'm really trying to make is like, all the stuff we've learned about letters, this is one of the things for me. All the stuff we learn about doing stuff with letters is just as possible with ones and zeros. And sometimes that's sort of like the, whoa, that's where the magic feels like magic. It's just ones and zeros, and you're just, you're just jumbling them around again. OK, um, so to fix this problem where the key is too short, you could just come up with a key that covers the full length of the plain text, um, where you could generate some random key matching the full length of the plain text, uh, or you could like repeat the key across the plain text. So just based on everything we've learned so far, which of those things do you think is better to do? Re repeat the key or, <laughs> or not? Don't repeat the key. Perfect. OK. Um, so a major reason not to repeat the key is because every cipher we've seen uh, comes from ancient to modern times has been a stream cipher. And that is it operates on a single digit or character at a time. And we've also seen that that creates a lot of these problems where encrypting one plain text digit with one key digit or repeating the key leaks information about the key into the cipher text, which makes it vulnerable to attacks. So this is just as true for binary as it is for letters and symbols. So just XORing plain text bits with key bits or data uh, is vulnerable to all the same kinds of ciphers we've talked, uh, the problems in the ciphers we've talked about. So a striking example that repeating the key leaks plain data into the cipher data is if you take this image and you encrypt it in a way that just repeats the key to cover the length of the data. So in this case of an image, you can literally see the repetition problem that the bit level produces. It just produces more recognizable output, just a little bit different. So to address this, Horst Feistel, someone correct me? Um, at IBM in 1971 published the Lucifer cipher, great name by the way, the earliest civilian block cipher. Um, so instead of operating on single bits or digits, a block cipher operates on groups of bits called blocks. This simplified block cipher uh, reads the plain text input and a key and applies many rounds of bitwise operations like XOR, substitutions and permutations. 
So in this example, 16 bits of plain text is first XORed with 16 bits of a key. Then the output is grouped into four bit groups and put through these substitution boxes, which are sort of like an enigma where it's prearranged. This letter will always be this letter, or this bit will always be this bit, uh, which are like mappings. So then finally, the output bits from those substitutions are put through predefined permutations, which is like anagramming, right? So same thing we've seen. Substitution like enigma, anagrams, but it's done over and over, and then you throw some XOR in there as well. Uh, in this example, that whole process was repeated three times, and altogether, this is known as a substitution permutation network or an SP network. Um, you can find these kinds of diagrams for every major block cipher. They're designed to solve the problems we've seen by mixing bits and keep like plain data bits and key bits together in a way that tries to maximize the sort of scrambling jumbling of data about the key in the cipher text. Um, so here's a diagram of the Lucer, Lucifer SP network. And if you were to walk through it, you take 256 bits of a tweet, break it into 128-bit blocks, generate a 128-bit key, break, break each block in half and generate a 72-bit subkey and rotate the key. Okay, I'm just kidding. We're not actually going to go through that because it's ridiculous. Um, the point I want to make is that you could go through that if you wanted to. Like if you were to go look up a modern encryption cipher diagram, you would see substitutions, permutations, and XOR. And we've covered all of that. So you kind of know a little bit. If you really, really wanted to go learn this stuff, you could. It's not magic. Nobody, nobody uh, invented magic when they did all this, right? And it builds on all of the crypto systems of the past, including anagrams, substitutions, all that stuff is in there. Um, yeah, OK, so here's the diagram for AES. So AES is what is used every single day zillions of times a day. I don't, you can, probably can't even count how many times a day it's used. Um, if you like YouTube videos, there's uh, a channel called Computerphile, um, and they have a really good couple of videos. One is on SP networks, and one is on AES specifically. OK, coming up on, am I taking too long, or how much longer should we go? I'm trying to figure out. Keep going? OK. OK, so but before AES was this DES, um, and DES is just a standardized Lucifer cipher with a 56-bit key that Feistel developed at IBM. So the NSA tried to convince IBM to make the key length 48 bits because they had enough budget to build a computer that could crack 48 bits. Um, so uh, IBM and NSA compromised on a 56-bit key, which was like, eh, you know, catch us if you can. Uh, but with DES, the code makers are back on top. So even Colossus wasn't designed to attack block ciphers at all. Uh, so these block ciphers make it easy and quick to perform a lot of rounds of XOR, substitution, permutation, in binary. OK, but since computers keep advancing, how hard is it to find a 56-bit key? So with 50, 56 bits of ones and zeros, there's 72 quadrillion possible keys. In 1976, it was estimated to cost about $20 million to build a computer to crack such a key, uh, which was like barely available to the NSA. OK, so now I'm going to reset the timeline a little bit for the computer age. Uh, and we've got a pretty even battle going on between the code makers and the code breakers uh, using computer force against uh, code breakers also using computer force. But as we saw with Colossus attacking Enigma, brute force could still be a problem. Uh, and since 1970, every two years, uh, the price of electronics has been cut in half and the power has doubled. So this is Moore's Law. Everyone's familiar with Moore's Law or heard of Moore's Law? Okay. Uh, so very quickly, 56-bit keys were vulnerable to reasonably priced brute force attacks. Um, but a great thing about binary is that it lets you add bits to increase the key space exponentially. So with just one more bit, there's 144 quadrillion possible keys. So still, you can't just throw a single bit onto one of these block ciphers that's made to work specifically with 56 bits, um, which means that Moore's Law is helping the code breakers more than the code makers right now. So the makers developed triple DES. Uh, so this is DES, relatively simple method of increasing the key size. Uh, so without having to invent a completely new block cipher, it uses three different 56-bit keys, it just uses them in three steps. Encrypts with the first, decrypt with the next, encrypt with the third. So this is a backwards compatible way to use a 168-bit key with DES. 
So it's just called triple des, right? Uh, you don't have to, this is where everything, everything doesn't have to click right now. <laughs> so uh, uh, in fact, Windows 11 still supports triple des EDE. So this was developed in 1971, but this, now we're getting into like, these are the techniques that are still used today. Now, if you, you have to set Windows into, hey, let's be insecure, YOLO, join us, mad, join us as we dance madly on the lip of the volcano setting in order for it to support this, but it will. Okay, um, but if these sizes are so strict, what happens with messages that are longer than the key size? So how do you use like a 168-bit block cipher to encrypt, say, 336 bits or a gigabit? So to apply something like triple desk to data larger than 168 bits, you need a block cipher mode of operation. And this is where the, your eyes can glaze over now. These are all jargon words. Um, the simplest mode is called ECB, which is just repeating the key. And we already know that's no good, right? Um, in fact, this image that I showed, this was ECB. So we don't use ECB anymore. Um, so instead, Triple Desk uses cipher block chaining, or these days there's a thing called GCM, which is more performant. Uh, it uses the output ciphertext from the previous step um, as input for the next one. So this mode helps scramble like the uh, randomness, the garbage that you got from the first step of encryption goes into the key of the next step, and on and on and on and on and on. Um, so then the final cipher data is less obvious. Okay, so with triple des and new block modes, uh, the code makers have a technique to stay on top of Moore's law, but we still have this problem that has haunted cryptography forever, which is how the heck do you come up with the keys and how do you share them with your recipients? So yes, we're up to the 60s, um, but we actually need to keep stuff secret. It's not all love and, and happiness all the time. Uh, so in the early days of computing, people did it like they did with Enigma code books, where banks would literally fly employees around with disks of keys handcuffed to, uh, to themselves. Um, but as we built up bigger and bigger networks of computers, that became a giant pain. Um, so the code makers needed a way to communicate a secret key over a non-secret channel. Uh, and by the way, I used Dolly to create a lot of these images in this presentation, and the prompt I used for this one was 1970s painting of two people trying to whisper secretly in a crowd of people who are trying to hear what they're saying. <laughs> and it somehow also created this nightmare fueling <laughs> evil, dead-eyed, triple-grinning fiend of a woman who I'm going to call Eve for comedic reasons. So anyway, Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman published New Directions in Cryptography with an amazing breakthrough. So to help understand how they solved the problem, let's set it up clearly. So two people, Alice and Bob, need to communicate securely. And to do that, they need to share a secret key, but they only have public channels between them. Eve is always eavesdropping. So how can they share a secret with each other without sharing it with Eve? So they came up with what we now know as Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Diffie-Hellman needs a one-way function that's some operation that's easy to perform in one direction but very hard to reverse. So for example, it's easy to mix two colors, but given a mixture of two colors, it's nearly impossible to reverse them. So in this a color analogy of Diffie-Hellman, Alice and Bob publicly agree on some base color, which Eve also sees. And then Alice privately chooses a secret color and mixes it with a public color and sends her mixture to Bob. And Bob privately chooses his own secret color and mixes it with a public color and sends his mixture to Alice. So at this point, Alice, Bob, and Eve all have the public color and the two mixtures. And now comes the cool part. Alice and Bob each add their own private color to the other's mixture, and both arrive at the same shared secret color. But without one of their private colors, Eve can't get the same color. Now, this shared secret is like the shared secret you need for doing something like triple des. But to do this in a computer, you have to do it some way to do it where you're coming up with a key that's binary. Uh, a key can be anything that can be a, encoded as ones and zeros, so anything like a number. And because we can use numbers for a key, there's lots and lots of cool math algorithms we can use to come up with a shared secret color. We won't go into the math today. There's absolutely not time. Um, but I do have slides about 
uh, the popular Diffie-Hellman math uh, algorithms use modular arithmetic and elliptic curves. Elliptic curves are more modern, they're stronger, smaller keys, more performant for mobile devices. Um, the important thing is that this breakthrough to establish a shared secret over public channels is the foundation of public key cryptography. So with Diffie-Hellman, you can establish secret keys with anyone in the world over public channels and then use those in encryption algorithms like triple DES or AES. It's, it's hard to overstate how important public key cryptography and Diffie-Hellman has been to like computers, the internet, modern life. Uh, most TLS cipher suites require you to use a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And the only reason Windows 11 in TLS 1.3 doesn't explicitly state it is because it's built into TLS 1.3. They were just like, there's no reason to do it any other way. Um, so with Diffie-Hellman and triple DES or AES, code makers have brought us to the current age of cryptography, where we have a way to establish secret keys with anyone on the internet and an encryption algorithm that uses them and modes to use the keys to encrypt any message. So we've gone from skiddly to triple DES with CBC. Um, so how many, how many people have ever seen something like this, like a, a big long string like this? OK, well, now you know most of the parts of it. So this is describing a TLS connection that uses Diffie-Hellman to establish a secret key and then uses that key for triple DES, encrypt, decrypt, encrypt with cipher block chaining mode of operation. So the point is, all these complicated modern crypto ciphers didn't come out of nowhere. So you can actually go learn about all of them if you wanted to. We had to blaze through it really, really fast. Um, but they're not magical, is the big point. Um, so if you open your network developer tool on any modern web browser, I did this last night, and look at the security info, um, you'll see the cipher suite used in the HTTPS connection that delivered that web page. And that's where I'll end this part of the talk with maybe the two most basic and important uh, lesson for you as coders <laughs> with cryptography. Don't invent your own crypto. Um, as modern software engineers, we have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to good, popular, mature, easy to use cryptography libraries. Um, use those, don't ever invent your own. They've been built on, as we've seen, centuries and centuries of people doing this. And then when you're using the crypto libraries, uh, mind your secret keys. So all the fancy crypto math in the world is not going to help you if the secret password is one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Um, so uh, let's see, the obligatory, who knows this one, the XKCD? Okay, so a crypto nerd's imagination, the laptop's encrypted, let's build a million dollar computer to crack it. No good, it uses this huge you know, RSA algorithm. Ah, the evil plan is foiled. But what would really happen is his laptop's encrypted, drug him and hit him with this $5 wrench until he tells us the password. <laughs> you got it. Um, so that is all I'm going to say. There's a whole lot more, but that's, that's where I'll stop, and we'll switch to questions now. Um, the, the key thing is this thing called Shor's algorithm. So if you want to go look it up later, you can look up Shor's algorithm. It is a way to use a quantum computer of a certain size to come up with keys that are used uh, in all of the modern crypto ciphers, like way faster than brute force, than just guessing them. Like Shor, Shor's algorithm is like, oh, you can get to it a lot faster uh, than just guessing. So. There's all kinds of math. I don't understand most of it. Like I, I tried a couple times. The best thing I saw when I was trying to figure out quantum computing and quantum cryptography was someone who was giving a talk, and they were saying, like, if you think you understand quantum computing, you don't. And then once you realize that you don't, that's when you actually understand. <laughs> like, OK, good. New technique. Hmm.
Uh, I'm trying to make it make sense. But again, you said the word quantum, and I don't understand it, which means we're probably doing it right. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think, like I said, you'd have to look up the details of Shor's algorithm, um, because that's where, with, yeah, it's, it's the code breakers getting access to a new piece of technology called the quantum computing, and then saying, like, oh, with quantum computing, we can use this thing called Shor's algorithm, and we can come up with these keys that we, you know, before would have taken us billions of years. So beyond that, I'm not really sure how to explain that part of it. <laughs> and then right behind you. Um, Yeah, I was thinking about this driving over here because I knew the AI question and machine learning question would come up in context of cryptography. I haven't seen anything specifically around like somebody built an AI to try and break all the ciphers. I think especially the wave of AI that we're seeing right now is very much the language model uh, flavor of it. And machine learning at the more broad level is really good at taking a bunch of data that has some kind of pattern in it, recognizing what that is, and then potentially making new pieces of data with similar patterns. But the whole point of cryptography is that you are eliminating patterns from the data completely. So I don't think you'll ever come up with like, hey, let's build this AI that can look at ciphertext and then figure out how to break it. Like I think that breakthrough in trying to break ciphertext came with cloud computing, where it was like, I don't have my laptop, I have, you know, I have zillions of CPUs or GPUs that I can throw at the problem. Where I do think, as I was, as I was thinking about this, where I do think AI could cause issues on breaking encryption is I think that AI will help come up with more and more Shor algori Shor's algorithms. Like I think researchers will be able to use generative AI to come up with stronger mathematical algorithms that can break ciphers. So I think like Shor's algorithm is the one that we know of, but it feels like AI, I don't know, ever, has everyone been using AI a lot? Like I just, I bought the premium chat GPT and mess around with it. It is striking how much how much quicker you get at solving problems when you have an always on collaborator that doesn't need to go take coffee breaks and stuff, right? Like, that's pretty cool. But I, I, I think that's what I came to just like thinking about it for a few minutes is that I think, especially this wave of generative AI will help us come up with more Shor's algorithms and that could pose a danger to what we do now. More obscured for sure. Um, so that's probably a good, that's a really good caveat and insight is that, like we saw with all the others, right? Um, the key is in there <laughs> in that ciphertext somehow, right? Um, the algorithms that we use right now, AES and those kinds of things, have been designed, and a lot of cases, like at least parts of them, I think, have been like mathematically proven to, they call diffuse, and I forget there's another word for it, but to basically take all of those characteristics of a key and like scramble them up so much in the cipher data that it's mathematically like not feasible to try and get to it from there. Now, we've seen over and over again, right, and with Shor's algorithm as well, that doesn't always work. So yeah, it's, it's more accurate to say not that the that data about the key has been removed, but it's just become really, really hard to, to find it. And you had a second question? Just about your actual, like, um, whatever you want to talk about with, like, what a job would look like and what the job would look like and what the job would look Yeah. Um, if you wanted to get into cryptography engineering, uh, so we have a cryptography engineering team at Firefox that does nothing but cryptography. 
and they do the kind of work that they would do is there is a probably a research paper that describes well let's take the post quantum one there's a lattice based cryptography algorithm that's being proposed by NIST to be the new I forget which piece of the whole protocol it, it takes it's like maybe the new AES or something like that or maybe it's just coming up with keys but right now it's just in a math form and a research paper and the cryptography engineers will be like well we need to actually write that into code and then go test it and see if it actually works the way that it should work and if it is performant and if you can actually run it on a mobile device and all this other stuff right so that would be what I would call like really in the guts cryptography engineering like taking math and turning it into code <laughs> now very few people in the world like do that or need to do it at that level uh, another big thing that I do from security engineering standpoint is just knowing enough about this that whenever I'm using cryptography because I think like oh we want to secure this piece of data that I'm actually using it right or using it correctly or if I'm coming up with some new way to use it which I can describe one or show show one of those um, that like I, I just have my bearings around this kind of technology that I can use it and so then at the highest level I'd say if you if you're just like just I hate oh, I hate when people say just um, if you're doing software engineering you're working on something that's not security but it needs to be secure uh, like I said probably the biggest thing there is to know that these cryptography libraries that are going to be available to you in whatever language you're using um, use the ones that are mature use the ones that are popular because the bugs have been found um, and use them the way that the docs tell you to use them is like the the main sort of like when you're writing code do that so that's kind of three levels of I guess how you might apply this and at different depending on how deep into it you go uh, there was more at hand there was another yeah. All right, let's see. Yeah. Um, I took all the slides out. It might be in a different presentation. Um, so around the time of either World War I or World War II, there was a crypto system that came out called a one-time pad. Uh, so one-time pad does essentially what we talked about but it's totally infeasible which is you've got a message that's a gigabyte long you generate a random key that's a gigabyte long and you just XOR it and then you never ever use that key ever again for anything no matter what but somehow you now have to transfer a gigabyte key and if you're going to transfer a gigabyte key securely with a gigabyte message securely why don't you just transfer the freaking message securely right like so but I think, if I remember correctly, and do not tell the Mozilla cryptography engineers that I'm saying this because they will tell me I'm wrong, but I think it was actually like sort of mathematically proven-ish that using a one-time pad like that is not vulnerable to any kind of crypt analysis. So that was, the, that was like the perfect encryption system, but it's totally impractical. There's like absolutely no way you could you would, could or want to use it. I think as uh, I don't know of a way to do it for sure but like I said I'm not a cryptography expert um, I would say how I described it just now is basically like my understanding is that if you did a one-time pad in, with modern data it would come down to I have this one gigabyte file of ones and zeros and I'm going to encrypt it with a one gigabyte key of random ones and zeros but now I have to get this one gigabyte key to you for you to decrypt it. And if I already have some secure way to get a one gigabyte key to you, why wouldn't I just give you, <laughs> why wouldn't I just use that to give you the one gigabyte file? The key by itself. Right. So, so, yeah, it's, it's like, yeah, yeah. Like I had to, I had to, I had to know that I could securely give you this key which was a gigabyte. But if I already knew that I was securely giving you a one gigabyte key, why wouldn't I just use that same way to give you the one gigabyte file instead? It's just extra steps. Yeah, in the back. There's really no what? Oh, yeah.
Yeah, you might for that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, so and that's an important point on the coding side of things. And usually this is built into the cryptography libraries that you'll use is that they will use the, there's like, uh, like in Python you're talking about, there's a random module, but there's a, I think it's random bits, and then there's uRandom. One of them is the one that uses, I'm going to call it the most cryptographically random thing available to the device. So in Python, you don't have to worry about any of this. And if you're using the library, you don't have to worry about any of this. Just use, instead of using random.random, .random, use random.urandom, or use crypto.random, or whatever it is. When you do that, it will look on this laptop. There's a different way to get the most randomness possible versus my phone, versus my watch, versus whatever you know, uh, system or device your, oper your code is running on. Just use the libraries, and they will try to come up with what you're talking about, which is like, cryptographically secure random numbers and not just some random number. Because some of them, the cryptographically secure ones are less performant or whatever. So you might be using other random functions elsewhere in your code where you just need like random text and that's fine. Uh, but when you're doing cryptography, you need to use the cryptography library's random function. Uh, yep. And it, it really does go down. That's what our cryptography engineers at Firefox would do is in JavaScript, there's a crypto API. And you can, you can in JavaScript, there's two different functions for getting a random bit, random data. 